We are in Champions League, man. That was my Dilly din, dilly dong, come on. Ancara Messi, 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 Ancara
Now you've you've played for and coached at, at Red Star Bar- Belgrade, a club with phenomenal reputation, especially when I was growing up in, in Ireland in the in the nineties, knew all about it. What did you learn from growing up from players like Stojkovic, Panchev, Prozanecki, Savicevic? So that's a that's very interesting. So when I was a kid, I was a, I I become be, became part of Red Star Academy in 1987. So I was nine years old, and when Red Star won a Champions League in 1991, I was 13 years old, and uh, I didn't miss one session. Uh, uh, first team uh, they had so th- that time like you said Red Star was one of the best teams in the world and uh, with a lot of talents on the field and every session first it was a privilege for me to watch all these players the other thing that from every session you could learn something the way they play the way they see the game the way they receive the ball how they pass Everything, everything, how they move. So I was just watching, 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 and trying to 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 take most of these guys. And uh, and I think well, the good thing back then was that we had always good players. So the new generation had the opportunity to learn from the older players, and that was like a chain. So yeah, that was a big advantage to 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 watch these guys. Was that part of the club philosophy then? Were you encouraged as a young player to go and watch them train and watch them play? To be honest, it wasn't philosophy, but uh, I think all the kids there love the game so much and we are a huge Red Star fans or partisan or whatever, for whatever club you root for. Mm. And then you just want to go to watch your, like, their their, uh, their uh, your, uh, role models and you want to watch them. How they play, you know. You want to use every possible moment to see them. Either it's session, either it's the game. So it wasn't mandatory. It was just our love uh, for the club, our love for the game, and that 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 love brought us to to practice field to watch every session. As a youth player, then was there more focus on the technical, physical, tactical, mental, or was there a blend of everything in your experience at Red Star? Yeah, so basically, it's like you said, it's a blend of everything. And you cannot play soccer if you are missing something of this. But but we were always know, known as uh, European Brazilians. And for us, the technical part of the game was very important. So I remember every session, like at least 45 minutes, you had individual work every player one ball and just do work on your technique 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 and if you didn't have a good technique you you were just out you you couldn't pass the selection without a good technique and uh, that's something that coaches were encourage us to 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 work and they demand that so work on your technique work on your technique they, they lie so for example we were coached to how to make the, the player not because we don't respect that player it's the way we can be that guy how to play one one and when you have open situation go for it go one we one and that's something that was that's part of the culture and that's what people love in my country to see and obviously the coaches love that the same yeah you mentioned demanding coaches technique over physicality then moving then what's the difference then from that youth experience to a US academy player do you see many differences i know you you don't work in the academy but i know you see a fair bit of it when you're watching soccer yeah so, so yeah I, I first i want to say something many people are asking me what is the difference between like uh, like uh, youth development in europe and youth development here in the united states First, when we speak about Europe, I always give example of two countries. One, it's like Spain and Italy. They are neighbors. And if you want to study how they, they develop the players, it's completely two different cultures. And they are neighbors, you know. And uh, every country, what, what I'm trying to say, that every country has like own, own culture, own thing that they like. And it's everywhere around the world. So, like in Serbia, we said we want technical players and we encourage our guys to work on their technique here it's a little bit different but we as a nation we are not like strong guys 
fast guys. We don't have pacey players. Here you can find different different type of the players, and uh, something that's something that is different. Basic basic selection is a different, and and obviously it's a part of the culture. And this is the the the, the difference between if I can compare Serbia with with uh, with uh, youth soccer here in the United States because you can see here more uh, uh, players with physical abilities than in Serbia, but maybe the technical level is not that high like we have back there in Serbia. Moving on now to your, your coaching, what element of being an assistant coach do you enjoy the most between training, the tactical preparation, the games themselves, individual work with players, or is there another aspect of being an assistant that you enjoy most? Yeah. Uh, basically, I like all of that. Everything you mention is just like on a daily basis, you have all these things. You have to to prepare this, the, the session, then you have training. Obviously, when you speak about training and you plan your training, you think about tactical preparation, what you need for the next game or what you need from your team to do. And uh, it's, it's rating with game management. And then, of course, if you want your players to, to be successful and to have the uh, abilities to do what you want from them, you have sometimes to work individually with them. So everything what is related with the uh, coaching uh, job, it's, it gets me excited. So, yeah, basically all of that. We're pretty clear on assistant coaches' roles in the preparation stage and then their support towards the head coach during the game. But after the game, I don't think the coaching community are at the highest level. The coaching community are aware of what goes on after the game. Can you talk about your specific role after a game, both personally and then as a staff, uh, in terms of w when do you rewatch it? How do you review it? And is there a, an emotional break before the staff meets the next day? Yeah, so basically, like, usually I'm working now with Pauno for, this is the seventh year, and uh, usually after the game, you know, we are emotional after the game, but we usually speak about the game, but not, we just give, like, first impressions, not that we judge the game, positive, negative, this was good, this was bad, just some general notes, you know. Uh, that's and every every time after the game we have a short conversation what we could do better what we did good and uh, basic things what I like to do next morning when I'm more relaxed I always want to to see our game and to see what 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 really we could do better and uh, what we did well and then when we have next session and when I approach to to Paolo in this case. I want to have my opinion about all this stuff. So that's that's something that that's if I can say my job after the game. I don't have specific um, job like I have to do this or that. It's a basic things, but that helps. That when you see the game and then you can approach to the group, you can approach individual uh, to the players to speak with them and just move on. Do you give much attention to statistics or is that review from you? Is that done basically sitting down and just re-watching the entire game? So statistics can say a lot, but I think I, I like to watch the game. Like statistic is good, but I'm not that engaged with statistics. Sometimes you can see that maybe the, that some player ran a lot by, by, by the numbers, but you don't see that on the field. You know, you don't see that influence on the game that he had. So basically, it's statistics can help, but what I feel about game and what I see, that's for me, it's most important. Uh, how much growth is in the MLS is there in terms of tactical variations? Is there more different styles appearing every year? Yeah. So look, I, I can see, I can see development like, Look, it's not just here in MLS. Every year you can you can see the new things, and some coaches are trying something different. They are like uh, trying to to uh, to take maybe their players out of routine. Some some coaches are uh, 
implementing something new in order to be better. And uh, I also, I can see here different styles that uh, and the same coach is trying uh, uh, maybe not just from the game to the game, but from the season to the season to, to try some, some new things, you know. And uh, that's for me, for me, it's, a, it's a great because that pushes us others. So, for example, if we play against uh, Columbus and every game is the same, every game is the same, we know what we can expect. But when you change something, okay, now we have to adjust. And it's like a check mat. So I, I, I. Th th that's something that's it's. Uh, I like about our job. Okay, now we are playing chess, check mat. You're changing this. How we can adjust? What we ha have to do in order to prepare for the game? But I see that those kind of things in an MLS, and I like it. People are not stuck with one idea. They are open to learn. They are open for new things. And personally, I like it. Whenever you guys went and played Bayern, how difficult was it? Because they can do so much with their style, and if you stop them one way, they might open up another. Did you spend more time in the preparation period, or were there just certain things that you realized, listen, that we just can't stop everything they do? Yeah, so so this is the thing, yes. Sometimes when you know that you can control the game, there are your going like, okay, this is offensively that we have to do in order to win, or this is defensively that we have to, to do in order to win. That's sometimes that you know this game, you should control the game, and you are the better team. Some, some games, it's not like that. And that's like a blank, blanket in an airplane. You know, it's not big enough. So when you cover your legs, you're opening your upper body. When you cover your upper body, you're opening your, your, your legs. So it's what you want. So it's and and I think in in the game it's consistently uh, adjusting to the different situation. And more you are ready to adjust, more you have chance to succeed. You know, like for example, you want to play against a team that is insisting of playing out of the back, and then you are preparing high pressure against them, and you are going with high pressure and high pressure, high pressure. But you cannot play high pressure ninety minutes. And there will be part of the game that you have to spend in mid zone, and part of the game that you have to sit back and to defend in low zone. And that that can be just like five or ten percent of the game. But if you are not ready for this five or ten percent uh, percent of the game, you can fail and you can lose the game because of that. So I think yes, there are specifics. Every game has some specifics, and team has some specifics that you have to work on it. But but you have to be ready for a different different uh, situations on the field that game can bring you. You know, sometimes you, look, you just have a more quality against you and whatever you do, you're playing against a better team and, you know, it's, it's whatever you do, they still have a solution how to, to beat you and there is nothing, not too much to do against that. It's uh, like our game against Bayern Munich, to be honest, the, the level is... They are very good, very good. So whatever we try to do, they have answer for that. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think that's a that's a great point about you know in coaching we talk about flexibility mostly in possession in coach education. But you know, do you think it's important that coaches should also be looking at being flexible out of possession? Because you're right. You can't play low block for 90 minutes and expect probably to win a game. Or you can't maintain pressing for a full game either. So, you know, be it, being flexible tactically is important out of possession as well. Yeah, yeah, flexible, it's a great word, actually. Flexible, it's a great, great word. Because, look, even if you watch the best teams in the world, take Barcelona as an example. Like Barcelona, I think 99% of the games, they are dominated by possession. But they're still in every game moments where they have to defend. They have they, they are sitting in low zone. Maybe it's like just three minutes out of ninety. But in that three minutes, they have to be successful, because because if they're not, if they fail in that uh, that three minutes, they can lose the game. And yes, we are working on the, the, the or our identity, our style. We want possession. We want uh, fast recovery. Uh, after we lose the ball, we want to press the high. We want to press high. Yes, and during the practice is the most of our time we will spend to uh, we will spend towards our style of playing. But 
there are certain things on the field that will take us out of our comfort zone of playing. So we have to uh, to be flexible to have answer on that, and that's and that then you have a complete uh, picture and you can succeed. That's at least how I see the game. Yeah, it brings us on nicely to the next question. That's you know from from observing your training at the fire this year. You know, I saw a great deal of variety in the exercises that you guys use. It was always something different every day when I when I when I looked. Um, how important do you think that is to keep? The environment fresh and, and enjoyable for professional players. Yeah, it is very important. It is very important because first, it's routine. Every time player comes to some routine, it starts to become boring, and then you're thinking you're doing something, but actually there is no effect of that. You're doing nothing. So that's what, like you said, to refresh the things. It's in, in my eyes, it's it's very important. Uh, can you just give us a little overview of, you know, how training that week is structured in terms of when is the day that you break down preparing for the opposition or is Friday a little day before the game a little easier or how is the training broke down week to week? Yeah, so basically like first day after the game, it's usually the recovery day for the players that played last game and we want to make that session that... Uh, for the players that didn't play, if we can give them something that is similar to the game, and uh, let's let's pick if it's Saturday game, that's Sunday, Monday is usually day off, and then Tuesday, Wednesday are days that we are working on our style, you know, and what is important for our game. Thursday and Friday are two days that we are adjusting to the next game. Okay. Thursday, what we defensively have to do, do against our next opponent. Friday, offensively, what we have to do, including set pieces in, in both days. So basically, that's like a, a general weekly plan during the, the season. We talk a lot in the coaching community about weaknesses in our soccer culture. What do you think are the strengths of the soccer culture here in the U.S.? Yeah, so what I like, one thing that I realize. At the very beginning, when I came, it's diversity that 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 soccer United States has. It's a so you have players from all around the world, and it's a big advantage. It's a big advantage because every player brings something his culture, and then the, all together creates uh, American soccer culture here. And that's something that it's for me. It's very important. What I like also, I can see the the. The coaches are enthusiastic about the work and uh, the organization in the session is, is, is good. The one thing that maybe uh, U.S. soccer lack of is like the league. MLS league exists only 22 years. So it's not a big time and uh, there is not a big uh, history about the soccer in this country. And the history creates the culture. So to have like real identity uh, soccer here, I think we have to give uh, uh, more time to, to this game. Staying on the subject of culture, I, I listened to a Robbie Keane interview recently and he said the biggest impact he made at the Galaxy was changing their culture and teaching the younger players the drive to win. Just going back to the, the culture over here, what do you think is the best way that at the youth levels, that that competitiveness, uh, how to act like a professional, how do you think the best way we can do that in the U.S. is? I, I, I mean, I could see that the same. And uh, I can't say that's a lack of passion. I just think the demands have to be different. So for me, like, even if you're like an uh, eight years old boy or girl st starting to play soccer, and for example, you're juggling the ball. And for me, like, every touch with the ball is a battle that you have to win. You know, and small, the, all these small pieces, like everything, every detail, you want to be perfect. And that uh, perfection brings you to, 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 you want to win everything. It's not just about the game. It's not like we are playing scrimmage or we are playing the game and I want to win. In order to win the game, you have to win all these small battles during the session. You have to beat your teammate for your place in the team. And it's not everything that it's good job and well done. It's about 
what is really good and what is not good and what is not good let's improve and all these small battles let's win it let's win it let's win it and then you're going to have a big picture of winning and uh, it's th that's something that we as a coaches have to push our players it cannot be the same if you miss the pass or you have a, or you make a, a good pass it's not the, the same if if one one challenge you lose or you win and at the end it's not the same if you win the game or you, you lose the game and that's it's it's tough to change that with a pro level it starts from very early ages and uh, those small battles we have to encourage our our players to win these small battles on daily basis in every session Brilliant, brilliant. How does a player like Bastian Schweinsteiger help the younger players at the fire to grow and, and learn how to become a better professionally? Yeah, so, so, so like we spoke at the beginning, I had that privilege to watch players like you mentioned, Stojkovic, Pancho, Prosinecki, Savicevic, Jugovic, and uh, just watching these players, it's 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 a big thing. You can see... So, for example, we speak about technical level. You can see the guy that was a world champion. What is his technical level? Okay, we speak about physical level. What is his physical level? We speak about his tactical... Tactical... Uh, uh, his tactical level. What are his uh, decisions? What kind of decision he's making with the ball, with about, without the ball, defensively, defensively? I think... Young players here are privileged to have opportunity to watch Bastian Schweinsteiger. He's two years here, one of the best number six in the history of this, this game, in my opinion. And uh, I would love to see even more kids watching our game and be focused on what he's doing on the field every game. Because that's an opportunity that rarely you're going to have in your life, to watch that kind of players live every, every, every week almost. Yeah, when I watched him go play live, I I was taken back by the movement. Like I thought at his age he would be less mobile, but this but the intelligence of the positions he was taken up, and every time he moved as a six, he moved wide or he moved up or down. He got the ball within two or three passes. His ability to keep influence in the game is it the intelligence that jumps out to you or the technique? Both. Both. This is, for me, where you start soccer. What is your understanding of the game? Like you said, soccer intelligence. And what is your technical level? That's where you start the game. And uh, that's what Basti has. And that's what, that, what brought him to the, to the level where he, he, he is. And it's uh, the way that he sees the game, the way he reads the game, his decisions on the field, it's, it's, that's the highest level. And that's why he is what he is. He still seems to enjoy it as well. Every time you go out there, he, he never misses training sessions, right? Really? Yeah. yeah. That's what you mentioned and what we spoke about. And this is one of the things. If you have passion and if you love this game, you have basics to, to succeed. You know, and uh, it's very funny to see Basti every, every session, how enthusiastic he is and how much he loves this game. If you remember at the beginning of, of our, our uh, conversation, we spoke about that. How is that important for, for, for one young player? What can drive him to, to be su successful, to succeed? And that's what Basti dealt You have to love this game. Brilliant. Uh, your sons are now playing the game over there. I bumped into one of them just before I left. Is there a piece of advice that you are constantly repeating to them? Uh, in our house, the, 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 the soccer is topic 24 hours per day. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I feel they are giving advices to me, not me to them. <laughs> but uh, we speak a lot of, about the soccer. And I think they, they spending so much time with me, they know the way I see the, the game. And they know what I like about the game. And I'm very romantic when I speak about soccer and maybe old-fashioned guy. but uh, And... But also what I want from them and to to they have to listen to their coaches and every player because their coaches are making decisions and they have to follow their coaches. You know, and whatever I think on somebody else, it's not important. I, I, I think they have their leaders, that, that's their coaches, and they have to follow them. And this is maybe the best advice that they are giving them always. And, uh, you know, sometimes you, every player, you have that in soccer, maybe you love your coach, 
but maybe sometimes he wants from you to to play the way you don't like actually but i'm always saying the most important for you is to play play and then find the moment when you can do something that you really like like in the game but but that's just going back they have to follow their leaders and that's their coaches and that's the best advice i i give them and the last one what advice would you give to to coaches first one th- one thing they don't need to rush so they have to have their uh, path and uh, they have to have their strategy how they going to plan how they going to become a pro coach uh, or to work on pro level and what are the steps they have to follow their sta- their steps they have to invest uh, in their self uh, to get most experience they 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 can have the other thing is they have to have clear idea of what they want like the 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 first question you 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 ask me what what is their coaching philosophy and uh, of course every coach has to have a role model but you cannot blindly follow your role model because we are all different and you have to find yourself in, in w- w- who are you what is your coaching philosophy and th- th- that's like this is my coaching philosophy this is my plan and let's go step by step invest in yourself don't rush and try on daily basis to learn most take most every day from 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 this game and sometimes things are in soccer are changing fast and we never know when we're going to get opportunity but one one thing that we have to be ready we have to be ready when that opportunity comes fantastic fantastic marco thank you so much brilliant absolutely brilliant really enjoyed that thank you gary thank you gary and uh i really enjoyed our conversation thanks so much to marco for his time and his insight there i hope you enjoyed that as much as i did and you can probably tell why i was really really keen to get him on the podcast I love his views on the game. I love how much he mentions the word love or the word passion and the advice he gives the coaches at the end I find really, really valuable because watching him coach and then hearing him advising coaches to find yourself and don't rush and invest in yourself as pieces of advice from a top professional coach I think is really, really important and really powerful because when you watch him work, that's what comes across If you had to watch him and assess him and then without this interview, you would probably say say he's a passionate coach. He cares about the details. You can say he loves the game. And I think that's a really, really important message to send to coaches who are in the journey that when you're building your philosophy, it has to align to who you are as a person and what your values are. Because if it's something that you've taken from somebody else or if it's something that isn't authentic or isn't real within you and who you are it's not going to have any impact so I would advise coaches to really really look a bit deeper in that there and that advice from Marco was to say right can you can you develop a philosophy that fits who you are and if your philosophy matches who you are as a person and brings out the strengths in your personality then all of a sudden your impact is going to be greater because the players are going to feel that and that will give energy and that will get credibility rather than walking on the field and saying, well, for the next 90 minutes, I'm going to be Pep Guardiola and walk like Pep Guardiola and talk like Pep Guardiola. And it's not going to work. It's not going to work. And the higher the level you go, probably the quicker the player suss out whether this person is genuine about what they believe in or whether this person really is just saying stuff and, and coming out with, with soccer terms or or whatever language they're using. So I thought that was great. The other piece for me was when he was talking about every touch you have with the ball is a battle that you want to win. We talk about culture, you know, and there was a lot there between the culture in Serbia and the culture at Red Star growing up and the culture in the US. But for me, the biggest cultural takeaway in that there was the culture of the practice field where he was talking about how you have to develop a culture of competitiveness. And we talk about competitiveness as, well, two teams fighting to win or a relay race 
or a consequence if you lose. And that's not really competitiveness at the highest level. Competitiveness is attention to detail. Competitiveness is seeing the game at a deeper level. And like you said, every touch you have with the ball is a battle you want to win. That is way, way deeper. Battling with perfection and battling with a high standard is way, 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 way more valuable than battling with a, a coach or battling with a team because you can take that and refine it and go back to it and get lost in the details. And I think that's where, you know, that's where I've I've been fortunate to watch Schweinsteiger work and train for a couple of months. And the, the level of detail is just phenomenal. And for someone, he's right, for someone to have that passion and that love for the game, that's what it takes to go out there and take those details every day and work on them and, and, and try to develop them and try to improve them even when you are great at them. So thought that was brilliant. Would love to hear your thoughts on it, what you enjoyed, what you agreed with, maybe what you disagreed with, any talking points at all. Love it when coaches reach out. Love it when coaches help spread the word of the podcast. I always really, really appreciate it. So Twitter at Gary Kernin, Instagram at Gary Kernin, Email Gary at modernsoccercoach.com. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for spreading the word. Have a great week. Enjoy. Thank you for listening to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. For more coaching topics, sessions, and resources, head on over to Coach Kernine on Facebook or visit the website at www.modernsoccercoach.com.